I won't hold the proceedings up anymore, but just to welcome you Philip and thank you for being here. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for the invitation. I'm speaking on uh, the, the Sultan, and the, the Sun King and the Sultan, or the Sultans, and Louis XIV and the Ottoman Empire. It's an extremely complex subject with many different strands. So I'll be weaving in and out of four or five strands. There is the Crusade and Jihad, which never completely died on either side. There is also trade, which never died and often trumps holy war, as we all know. There is pilgrimage, which also uh, never stopped, of, of Christians to the Holy Land and Muslims going by sea to the Hejaz and often being captured by French ships. And finally, what will perhaps interest you most is that there is scholarship, which also never died. So we begin with the Crusades. France was a Christian country, very proud. The kings are being descended from St. Louis, the great crusader. Here is Louis XIV. He becomes king in 1643. And he adored ballet and won ballet in 1653. He dances and chanting. And we will go in the future to Byzantium and eliminate the crescent. So holy war is always there in the background, particularly under Mazarin, his teacher in the 1650s. But there is another strand, real politique. Uh, here he is in, in a carousel, 1662, as emperor of the Romans, and his cousin, the Prince de Condé, is emperor of the Turks. They're very aware of the power of Turkey in Europe. But the other strand, much stronger in practice than dreams of holy war, is the ancient French Ottoman alliance since the 1530s for reasons that they're both against the House of Austria, which is ruling Central Europe, the Holy Roman Empire, Spain, and most of Italy. And so when François Premier had been imprisoned after the Battle of Pavia, his mother appeals for help to Sullivan the Magnificent. They do, in fact, have a de facto alliance. And here is uh, the articles of the treaty between Henri IV and Ahmed II. In 1604, the second book ever printed in Ottoman, printed in Paris in 1615. The French ambassador in Constantinople, the grandest, the most important, the best paid French ambassador was in Constantinople because of its world political and economic importance. He brings back <coughs> Ottoman, Arabic, Persian, and Syriac types from Rome, which already had them, because Rome is already beginning with the Counter-Reformation, an attempt to convert Christians in the Middle East. And the third strand, there is a proof that there is a functioning alliance. An Ottoman envoy actually comes to France in 1669, Suleiman uh, it's a, It's a, not a success. He's thought to be rude. There's rows about these matters which always absorbed diplomacy then. Who can sit on a chair or an armchair with a hat or a turban when he whether the king would stand up when he advances with a letter from the Sultan and so on. People really do write two or three pages about these matters. They're obsessed with ceremonial, but one ambassador does give the game away. He says, actually, ceremonial doesn't matter with compared to business. It doesn't really affect les affaires business. So they could have fun and games with ceremonial and just go on trading. And here is the key to French commerce with the Ottoman Empire, with the Levant, as it was called, is Marseille. Marseille is a pet child, a project of Louis XIV. He's not just obsessed with the Ile de France. Um, he makes it a, uh, he removes customs use in 1669 
He gives him many privileges, although he had been rebellious, and there's this massive extension of Marseille in his reign. And here is the arsenal for building uh, ships, galleys, and here is the prison where galley slaves were kept in horrific conditions, that goes without saying. Many of them were Muslims. One item that was traded in in the trade between the Ottoman and Bagrats was humans, the slave trade. It's still functioning. And France needs strong Maghrebis or Turks to row its galleys. Again, that is partly a prestige ship. It's not, it's really completely out of date in the late 17th century compared to sailing vehicles and so on. But Louis XIV went on with them. And when there's an exchange of slaves between Morocco and France, um, Louis XIV won't give up able-bodied galley slaves. He's so keen on them. And um, amazingly, one of the duties of French consuls throughout the Ottoman Empire was to supply the French Navy with slaves. So they're buying and selling Muslim slaves in the Ottoman Empire. But I've spoken to specialists about this, and apparently that's not totally surprising. This is the same trade from everything else. Um, and there's lots of letters from Colbert, Louis XIV's great minister of trade, also in charge of the navy, about buying Turks, buying Africans, and so on. And the center of the trade, but this is Marseille, a, a later century, but you see what a busy port it was. And here is some figures from this picture by Vernet of Turks. I, I think they're probably drawn from costume books rather than from life. Um, and here is the great port of Smyrna on the west coast of Anatolia, the key to Ottoman trade with Marseille. It's like a sort of Dubai of its time, very international. And that is a ship with the French flag, which then was white. Um, and already the capitulations give French traders and um, a considerable amount of freedom in Smyrna to do what they want, and ju even judges are restored. <coughs> and religion, the other great factor of in French Ottoman relations, um, Louis XIV would justify his friendship with the Ottoman Empire. He always denied <coughs> that he had an alliance um, by saying, Oh, it's only to protect the Catholics in the Ottoman Empire. And in fact, he did protect them. He did help Catholics take control of shrines which previously had been run by the Orthodox. The Catholic Orthodox war is just as fierce, if not fiercer, than any conflict between Christians and Muslims. And the treasures the Catholic churches of Jerusalem have accumulated and still own are simply extraordinary. Many given by the kings of France, like this cope with the royal coat of arms, France and Navarre, and the sun motif, sun rays. This is a, a unique example of 17th century French embroidery, because I think it is true that every single embroidery with the French coat of arms in France was destroyed at the time of the revolution. So Jerusalem looked after French artistic treasures better than France. And there was an incredible exhibition at Versailles about five years ago showing the, some of the Catholic treasures of the churches of Jerusalem. Not the Armenian, I mean, the Armenian and the Orthodox treasures, in addition, must be amazing also. And In 1674, the French ambassador, the Marquis de Nointel, has renewed the capitulations, the agreements by which French people could uh, trade and travel freely in the Ottoman Empire. With the Ottoman Empire, the Ottoman Empire doesn't have ambassadors abroad, but it knows what's going on in Europe through its own sources. 
merchants and foreign ambassadors. It knows Louis XIV's armies have been doing well in Holland, so it renews capitulations favorably. And this is an amazing picture by Jacques Carré, sorry, showing the French ambassador here, traveling around the Ottoman Empire with copies of the capitulations, which he made sure that the local authorities in various key cities have and cannot deny or ignore. And here you see Athens, then an Ottoman city full of mosques and minarets. The Parthenon is in perfect condition because the Venetians haven't yet blown it up in the war in 1687. And this is his party. Muslims, Janissary escort, these are probably some of his uh, grooms and horse escort who are Christians from their headgear, and he's with a friend, his French staff and his brother who's traveling with him. So already people are traveling really quite easily around the Ottoman Empire. This is part of four commemorative pictures which he had. He had the scene sketched while he's traveling and then painted by Jacques Carré in Istanbul and displayed in the embassy, the very grand, very splendid French embassy in uh, Beirut, and then brought back to Paris. And this has been kindly loaned by the Museum of Chartres to the Museum of St. <coughs> Athens, where you can go and see it. It's an extraordinary record of how Athens really was and now the discovery from last year in a Paris flat is a sister picture of the same ambassador, Mr. Benoit 1674, in front of Jerusalem. And, and nobody quite knows the full story, but Benoit descendants sold it in <coughs> the 18th or 19th century. It was taken to a chateau in uh, Normandy. It was engraved in a book in 1900, and then was clearly taken to a flat in Paris. And it's so big and heavy, it was then glued to the wall, <laughs> where it still is. And then the wall was plastered over, nobody knows why, probably perhaps in the Second World War, who knows. Or maybe the families are fed up with the picture. And then it was discovered last year as the flat was being converted to offices for Oscar de la Renta, Rue de Marignan, off the Champs-Élysées. So I recommend you all go and say you want to buy her. <laughs> and go up to the first floor and insist on seeing the picture, which I think has become a talking point and a sort of flagship for the company. I saw it, and it is, it's very hard to photograph here you see one photograph, you see the detail in the picture. The ambassador is on horseback. Theoretically, Christians weren't allowed to be on horseback. Of course, <laughs> the religious ones were. This is probably his secretaire d'ambassade. His brother, Janissary escort, the elite troops who always escorted diplomats wherever they went. So the Ottoman Empire is protecting and securing the future of its European allies. And here you see what I think, unless I'm corrected, is a very accurate picture of the old city of Jerusalem. The walls that are still there, the dome of the rock that is still there, Al-Aqsa, still there, and here the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So it's a great big swagger picture saying, look, I was ambassador in the Ottoman Empire. Look what I've done for the Christians in the Middle East. Though curiously, He's there to make sure pilgrims can go to Jerusalem, but there's nothing religious about the picture. It's all about power and rank and alliances, and in the end, the French-Ottoman alliance, the only fixed point in European diplomacy for 300 years, or one of the few with maybe England and Portugal and France and Switzerland. And, um, <coughs> a huge success of real politic over religious zeal. And here it is again. Here is the ambassador. He 
later had to leave because he spent too much money and had given, had yielded in one of these ceremonial wars where he allowed the Grand Vizier to insist that his tabouret or stool was not on the sofa or raised uh, seating area of the Grand Vizier, so equal with the Grand Vizier. And another picture, still lost, is of him talking to the Grand Vizier on this sofa. And there is another picture, still lost, of the ceremony of the Holy Fire in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. But I'm sure with time these pictures will be rediscovered, along with many other picture collections in France, commissioned by the French ambassadors, because they were so proud of their role in this exotic and important empire. Here he is again. Uh, we, we don't know much more about um, Nointel. He, he also commissioned Jacques Carré to do these drawings of the Parthenon sculptures, which are, I think, in the, the Acropolis Museum and are the most accurate drawings of the sculptures before the bombardment. And at the same time that the ambassador is going around the Ottoman Empire, Louis XIV is playing, again, another strand in his policy, the religious card. He is surreptitiously declaring himself protector of the Catholics of the Ottoman Empire without telling his good friend, the Sultan or the Grand Vizier, the Catholics of the Aegean, and then he is encouraging Orthodox worshippers in Aleppo to become Greek Catholics, to acknowledge the authority of the Pope, encouraged by the French consul in Aleppo, and these Greek Catholics have access to better books and education, education in Rome, and they are the vanguard of the Arab literary revival which begins in the 18th century. Um, and even uh, some of the patriarchs who Nuantel meets in Aleppo, they say, come on, forget about the European conquests. Why don't you come to Syria and liberate us? So the French ambassador is pretending to be the friend of the Ottoman, encouraging Christian hopes. And indeed, in Beirut, the Hazin family are appointed French consuls who are Catholics. And they say, come on, come and liberate us. And so relaxed is the Ottoman Empire about its own rules that the Hazins were allowed to import church bells from Rome to ring in the valleys of Lebanon, although in theory, church bells were illegal in the Ottoman Empire. So there's more details um, about these incredible ceremonial battles. Nuantel is sometimes, his head was forced down so violently when he's paying his respects to the Sultan that he fell to the ground. Um, and but Gira, who arrives in 1679 with instructions to ensure that Louis XIV was respected as the greatest, the most powerful, and the most glorious of Christian princes, and to preserve, and I quote, so this is a rare moment when Louis XIV admits the reality that there is, quote, the alliance which has existed for a long time between the two greatest the most powerful empires in the world. And after 1683, everything changes. What happens in 1683? The Ottoman army fails to take Vienna. The Ottoman Empire is weakening. Austrian armies are advancing in the Balkans. They reach Nish in southern Serbia. Some people think they're going to reach Istanbul. So suddenly, the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire gives up its ceremonial pretensions, and the French ambassador is allowed to have his stool on the sofa. Um, and 
and at the same time, uh, more details about the affair of the sword where a French ambassador tries to go and see the Sultan, pay respects, and he arrives in Istanbul with his sword by his side. This is illegal in Ottoman etiquette, and there's a, actually a fight just before the throne room in Topkapi Palace. The Sultan's come especially to Topkapi to receive him, and in fact, he never sees the Sultan because he won't give up his pretension to have his sword. But the alliance is so strong that it goes on regardless. All speaking the same language of monarchy, of who has the right to wear a sword or a hat, a kneel, or a, a stool, and so on. And uh, this double policy is very visible in the 1680s. The Ottoman Empire is in a panic. What does Louis XIV think, who's an entirely pragmatic? some would say, unprincipled, well, okay, if the empire collapses, what am I going to get? So he actually sends a mission in 1685, <coughs> or rather 1686, there's a new French ambassador, Monsieur de Girardin, with a team of engineers, draftsmen, and geographers, led by Monsieur Dortier, a former intendant de la marine in Dunkirk, and Contrôleur Général des Galères, in Marseille, i.e. a man at the heart of the French Navy. This is the Ministry of the Navy and Commerce, whereas the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is pro ottoman The Ministry of the Navy is much more aggressive. And they do a tour of the Ottoman Empire, taking, making views and taking maps and so on. And really, it's like aerial reconnaissance of the Second World War, that trying to see how to bombard or conquer or grab each city and port. And these uh, maps and drawings are in the archives of the Ministry of the Marine in Paris and were first published by Farouk Bilicin. And they really are the best view of the Levant at that time. This is Aleppo, the great trading city in northern Syria, with the citadel, which is still there, some mosques which are no longer there. This is, I think, Tripoli on the coast of, yes, on the coast of northern Lebanon, a great port. You see how carefully it is drawn. So if a French ship arrives, they know exactly what they're going to bombard. Or, and this is a time when Louis XIV is really bombing whatever he can. He bombs Brussels, Liège, Genoa, Algiers several times. Um, he's testing. He's testing weapons, as governments do, and in fact, there's a lot of people dedicated their books to Louis XIV, very nice ballet or music books, and somebody also dedicated a book called L'Art de Jeter les Bombes. <laughs> <laughs> they said, oh, sire, I hope you will not let this, and I quote literally, this noble art be extinguished. And they were very proud of having the best ships with the best naval bombardment and so on. Um, so here is Tripoli. Here is Sidon, the wonderful Lebanese port of Sidon, with its two castles, the Chateau de Terre and the Chateau de Mer, which is still there. Then a very important trading port. And this is Sidon again. You see how beautifully accurate it is drawn. France is the capital of cartography at this time. And here is Alexandria, a really fantastic view of 17th century Alexandria, looking much bigger and more prosperous than many Western travelers imply. That is Alexandria, and that is Rosetta on the Egyptian coast, also, also an important port at that time. There were many plans for France to grab Egypt, and even the French consul in Alexandria said, oh, come, send your ships, and we'll at least send you some antiquities to decorate the gardens of Versailles, the column of Pompey, and so on and so on. And this is typical of the French rhetoric at the time. Yes, sir, this is Grelot in his Relation Nouvelle d'un voyage de Constantinople. 
it never could be dedicated to read the poetry. Yes, sir, the peoples of these towns, full of the glorious name of Louis Le Grand, would think themselves happy to live under the gentle rule, well, not many people find it gentle, of a sovereign that they consider with reason as the first and greatest monarch in the universe. And they were, in fact, attacked in Alexandria, these cartographers of Brussels, because the locals weren't stupid. They realized what was up. And in fact, nothing happened, because the Ottoman Empire, as often happened, defied the views of the prophets. And I've lived uh, the Austrian attacks of the 1680s. But I'd like to show what one plan of Monsieur Dottier was to evacuate, if there was a French attack on the Ottoman Empire, to evacuate all the embassy from Istanbul, all the local mansions, before, and I quote, burning Constantinople following the instructions of His Majesty. All the Turks would be cut in pieces without quarter, except those thought good enough to row in the French galleys. The Ottoman Navy would be too weak. The government shouldn't listen to Marseille wanted to keep the Ottoman Empire for trade reasons. Rhodes would be returned to the Knights of St. John. France would take Constantinople, Smyrna, and Egypt. Other Christian princes, the rest, and the Sultan would be forced to withdraw to the Euphrates. Anyway, that's 1686. By 1688, the situation has changed. This is one of the key girls in the history of Europe, if not the world. Um, Louis XIV, and by the way, the relationship is also kept together by these armies of local merchants, priests, vice consuls, Ottoman officials, all of whom probably were open to bribes, and they had so much interest in keeping the relationship going that that's why it didn't fail. For example, the chief interpreter of the Ottoman government, the Grand Dragoman, Maverick Odalte receives an annual pension of 2,400 leave from Louis XIV. Mm -hmm. And as the Austrians seem strong, Louis XIV is determined, he abandons the policy of conquest, he's determined to keep the Ottoman Empire going. How does he do it? He sends armies into the Rhineland, September 1688, to burn and devastate the region and to draw Austrian and German troops away from the advance on Constantinople to defend the Rhine. And everything in European history then as now is linked because the French armies were on the Rhine, William of Orange is able to have this incredibly ambitious and dangerous amphibious invasion of England, November 1688. A European army crosses the channel, lands in Devon. There's no French opposition, no French raid on the Netherlands which could easily have stopped him. Um, Louis XIV doesn't listen to the French ambassador at The Hague who begs him to attack the Netherlands. Instead, he's saving the Ottoman Empire on the Rhine. And I'd just like to quote from some of the correspondence from the French ambassador to Versailles. He thought the Turks were so frightened they would leave Constantinople. All the shops were shut. The city was a veritable desert. Desert, sorry. In October, the ambassador <laughs> prophesied that either through internal revolts or external attacks, and I quote, the fall and entire decadence of the Ottoman Empire is inevitable. And so the Ottomans actually blackmailed Louis XIV. They promised they wouldn't make peace with Austria, provided he made war in Europe. And they accused him of being a coward, of staying on the Rhine with his arms folded. That's why on the 10th of September, he promises to march his troops on to the Rhine. And he thought it was more important to prevent the Turks making peace with Austria than to support James II in England. Um, and 15th of October, he's able to boast to his ambassador in Constantinople, who will tell the Grand Vizier, there is a general war in Europe, 
the Turks should profit from it by recovering what they had lost in Hungary. Use this information adroitly to stop the Turks precipitating a peace which in reality would be even more prejudicial to Christianity than to themselves by facilitating to the House of Austria the means to increase its power. So he's saying that peace is uh, anti-Christian. Uh, in complete hypocrisy. He denied, even to his own diplomats, that he wanted to excite the Turks against the Emperor, but he did. He wanted, above all, to keep a war going, not necessarily for the Turks to get Vienna, but to be always fighting Austria, so he can do what he wants in Western Europe. And uh, here are more of these French plans. This is Paros. You see how carefully each windmill is portrayed Milos and this is another key to European diplomacy this is John Sobieski King of Mar normally a French ally who is shown here liberating Vienna against Louis XIV's wishes he has a French wife she was meant to keep him on the French side but he was more frightened of the Turks advancing from the south but in the 1690s, he reverts to being a French ally again. <coughs> this is another French ally. This is uh, Rakuji, Prince of Transylvania, with both a French and an Ottoman protégé. He, he, in the end, he dies an exile in uh, just outside Istanbul, Tekeda, and his. <coughs> He's leader of the Hungarian and Transylvanian <coughs> malcontents, as they were called, or Protestants, who were constantly fighting Austrian domination in their countries, and are paid by Louis XIV to do so, and also are helped by the Ottoman Empire, because they, many of them prefer the Ottoman alliance to rule by Austria, because they prefer the um, much less direct protection of the Ottoman Empire to direct rule with German officials and heavy taxes and an aggressive Catholicizing policy by the Emperor in Vienna. He later goes to Versailles and becomes Louis XIV's protégé and writes very impressive letters about Versailles. <coughs> so you see that the Ottoman French alliance they also share protégés. It, it is a a general European phenomenon with uh, huge cultural, commercial, and religious consequences. And indeed, the French interpreter, Fontan, is often used by the Grand Vizier as a source of news in Europe. Um, after 1688, 1689, there is a recovery of the Ottoman armies, they're no longer worried that the Sultan will leave for uh, Asia. And the alliance gets stronger, the French pick up the carrying trade in the Mediterranean of Ottomans. Ottomans preferred to use French ships because they were less likely to be attacked by Venice, which is then at war with the Ottoman Empire, than their own ships. <coughs> And now, so the alliance is going on, the French ambassador boasts, oh, they never refuse me any request I make. And later, in the early 1700s, the Ottoman Empire supplies France with wheat. As French harvests are ruined by terrible winters, rains, uh, freezing conditions. The grains of wheat freeze in the soil. So they're importing wheat from different Ottoman ports. This suggests that Ottoman agriculture was far more efficient than its reputation. The French ambassador would get permission from the Grand Vizier that he would send letters to Sidon or Salonika or Alexandra and import wheat to Marseille. And he boasted that uh, over a thousand shipments were made in, during the war of the Spanish succession when France was close to the edge of the precipice. And in return, they sold 
the Ottoman Navy anchors and things like that, which the Ottomans didn't make themselves. Now we come to the last strain of the Ottoman-French relationship, scholarship, always very important since the reign of François Ier. Um, and this is Monsieur de Thévenot, a traveler who wrote a travel book about the Ottoman Empire, as many people did, and usually they dedicated them to Louis XIV, because he was so interested in geography and exploring the world, he would talk to people as they filed past his public lunch about their travels and encourage them. And that he is in a version of Oriental dress painted by uh, Philippe de Champagne. This is by Monsieur Grello. You see the voyage of Constantinople dedicated to the king, avec privilege du roi. A huge desire for knowledge about the Ottoman Empire. That's one of the many illustrations in his book. The dedication to the king. And then, one of the finest of all books is the Memoirs of the Chevalier d'Arvieux, who is envoy in Tunis, then in Constantinople, then in Algiers, and finally in Aleppo between 1679 and 1686. And he gives a marvelous account of life in Aleppo, where the different factions and groups and trades in the city sort of interlock. So it's like a very complicated clock, each piece of the machinery affects the others and provided uh, that it's well oiled and kept in tune, it works quite well. And of course, what oils it best are presents, bribes, money. I'll come to that later. And he, he knows the king because he has a little job at court as a query to the governors of the king's children. He speaks to the king at a levee. The king says, You'll be very pleased with this journey. You love me enough not to suffer in all that you negotiate with the port. Goodbye, monsieur. Go contented and well satisfied, and may God guard you. Have a good journey. Gracious tone of voice. Um, and so everybody talks to him, and he writes these memoirs partly to amuse the court and the royal family at Versailles. For example, he remarks that some Arabian horses because he's also buying horses in Aleppo, had genealogies stretching back 500 years, and I quote, something which few French nobles could prove. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he supplies a lot of information about Ottoman habits for the bourgeois gentilhomme, and he keeps Madame de Montespan in fits of laughter when he talks about Turkish marriage customs. I dread to think of what he said. Um, and uh, all the grandees of the court took pleasure in questioning me of the habits of the different peoples whom I had seen. All promised me their protection, and not one thought of procuring me the slightest favor or any position in which I could serve the king and advance my fortune. Uh, 1679, he goes to Aleppo. The king asks him if he's fed up with traveling to Turkey. I have nothing to recommend to you. Do for my service, for my honor and for my glory, what you're accustomed to do. I cannot be other than very content with you. Colbert will take care to give you my orders. Tell him what happens so that he keeps me informed. Adieu, bon voyage, stay well. And the queen gives him her hand to kiss. She says she will treat him as an ambassador of the Grand Turk and asks him to send her news and perfumes from Aleppo. There's this great curiosity about um, everything to do with the Ottoman Empire. And he speaks Turkish, Arabic, Armenian, Greek, and Hebrew, as well as Spanish, Italian, Latin, and French. He's another of these great intermediaries who keep the alliance going. And then he, he has a long description of life in Aleppo, visits to the, the Qadi, the judge, what they drink. They all drink uh, wine including the Ottoman officials, uh, coffee, tobacco, all these really quite novel uh, habits in the empire. And what he says in his 
memoirs is that the thing that gave him most trouble in all his six years in Aleppo was not the city itself or the officials, but the frequent quarrels between different Catholic orders, <laughs> Franciscans, <laughs> Capuchins, Carmelites, Cordeliers, and so on. Um, however much Turks appear to be good friends to Christians, they never forget their interests and defend them very well. That was his conclusion. Uh, at the same time, there is piracy going on, Knights of Malta attacking Ottoman ships and ships from Algiers, Tunis, and Tripoli, semi-independent states, which were in theory Ottoman vassals, but in practice took little notice of orders from Constantinople. They also raid European ships and coasts, and the, one of the main things is to get slaves, as I've said, many bombardments by French uh, ships of Algiers and Tripoli, Tripoli in Libya, that is, and they wouldn't have dared bombard Tripoli in the Ottoman Empire unless the Ottoman Empire collapsed. And there was a celebrated act of retaliation on the 6th of July, 1683. The French consul in Algiers and other Christian slaves were fired from a cannon. And this cannon was henceforth called La Consulaire after the person fired from it. And um, this sort of goes on. But finally, there is a sort of agreement in 1684, and France has three points on the Algerian coast, and presents are exchanged. The day of Algiers sends Louis XIV horses, lions, and camels. Louis XIV sends guns, medals, clocks, and tapestries to the day of Algiers. Um, meanwhile, uh, the search for scholarship goes on. One of Dalvio's duties is to send manuscripts to Paris. That is why Paris since then has always been a center of Oriental scholarship. They want to, and I quote, decorate France with the remains of the Orient and to make Paris a new Athens. But they're already cross because Dalvio writes that the English have emptied this land. In 1682, they've already got the best manuscripts in Russian Dalvio, and also they're constantly hoovering up our coins and medals. <laughs> Here is another travel book about uh, the Levant by Piton de Tonfar, who is sent down 1792. He's a botanist, and he's getting rare plants from Anatolia for the Jardin du Roi in Paris. And then the very, very famous Thousand and One Nights. Many of you will know the history of the manuscript, how much it owes to Antoine Galland's conversations in Istanbul, where he's staying in the French embassy. He's also looking for coins and medals for Louis XIV. He has a lot of conversations with Ottoman friends and scholars. And his translation, 1704, takes France and later the world by storm. And it is dedicated, please note, to a lady in waiting to the Duchesse de Bourgogne, the king's granddaughter in law. So it's encouraged by the court. They have masquerades, they dress up as Ottomans as well as Chinese, Indians, and so on. And it has a huge influence on uh, literature and in throughout the 18th century. Um, Another very famous book, a collection of a hundred prints representing different nations of the Levant, taken from pictures painted uh, from life in 1707 and 1708 by the orders of Monsieur de Ferriol, Louis XIV's ambassador in Constantinople. He was the lunatic who had tried to take his sword into the throne room. Nevertheless, he's a very effective ambassador in other ways. He commissions Van Roer to do these incredible pictures, and he's the one who gets the wheat supply for starving France in 1709. So these people have many different aspects to the embassies, their careers. Van Moor lives in Istanbul from 1699 till his death 
1737. Nobody knows much about him, but he was allowed to accompany ambassadors to the uh, reception of the <coughs> Sultan. He took drawings all the time, probably surreptitiously, and he obviously knows well the city. Here is the Sultan from a print in this book, which was immediately translated into German, Italian, Spanish, and English. It's the main source of Tiocovi of the 18th century. Here are the original paintings of the different <coughs> uh, professions of Istanbul and nationalities of the empire. They all hang in the Turkish cabinet in the Rijksmuseum because they were bought by the Dutch ambassador and by the terms of his will kept together. First with the Dutch Levant Company and now in the Rijksmuseum. And you can see different ones, different processions, professions, there is uh, the ecumenical patriarch, Greeks, Persians, Arabs, a Jewish woman taking goods to Turkish harems, um, a black eunuch, the Sultan, the Grand Vizier. Here you see an Albanian shepherd. Many different nationalities were then living and working in Istanbul. Here you see a janissary in ceremonial uniform. And a whirling dervish. And um, I recommend going. I mean, it's enough to go to, enough reason to go to Amsterdam just to see these pictures and the other Ottoman pictures in other museums <coughs> in the city. And Van Roo goes on, like, and he commemorates one of the finest diplomatic pictures, commemorates the French Ottoman alliance. Now there's a dancing boy from the Book of Prints, and that's showing how Van, well Van Roo knew the city. That is Patrona Halil, who led almost the first popular revolution in. Ottoman history, 1730, in front of Top Cafe Palace. It's a discontent with rising prices and an ineffective government. And this is 1724, the reception by the Grand Vizier in the Divan Hane, which you could see today, of the new French ambassador, the Vicomte d'Andrezel, and these are his two sons. You see, a very, very large party of French gentlemen, some of whom are travelers and some are merchants of the city and some are diplomats. It's the height of the French Ottoman, <coughs> one of the heights of the French Ottoman relationship, because France has just helped the Ottomans make peace with Russia. And I quote from what the Grand Vizier Ibrahim Pasha of the Tulip era said the ambassador. He suggested, again, the Ottomans are constantly requesting a written alliance, which France always avoids. He suggested a triple French-Ottoman-Russian alliance and said, quote, the Empire of France had for an infinite time been linked by a close friendship with the gate of happiness, that is, the Ottoman government, which was linked to eternity. The affairs of France and our affairs are common. And if there is any difference between us, it is only in religion. So religion is rather sidelined. And then there's a, a common myth that is used to justify the alliance. So one of our first sultans married a princess of the royal blood of France. He then gave a thousand blessings to Louis XV, wishing him a reign as long and fortunate as that of Louis XIV. And there I will end. I will just show you a few more pictures to show how the alliance went on. That is the reception of the throne room. Louis the XIV's Louis, Louis last reception of the Persian ambassador, showing how keen he is on these foreign alliances. The Ottoman ambassador coming to Paris in 1721 in the governor's tapestry. They're looking for instruction, technical instruction. It's a huge event. 
that he is, Saeed Mehmed Pasha, also involved in the first Ottoman printing press in Istanbul. And uh, finally is the reception of his son by Louis XV, 1741, in the Galerie des Glaces, only really important and exotic foreign embassies had a full reception in the Galerie des Glaces. And there uh, is Vergen as the, the longest serving ever French foreign minister, the man who engineered the independence of the United States in his costume as French ambassador in <coughs> Istanbul in the 1750s. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. You'll take questions. Yes. Could we have some light? Thank you very much, Alison. Yes. yes. Philip, if you can go back to the reception of the ambassador, the French ambassador, I think it was about eight or nine to Van Moore. Stop. In, in this, he's not being restrained, is he? No, because... I'd like to comment on that. I mean, is this part of the special relationship, yes, or is this more um, making things up? <laughs> Probably a bit of both. By then, uh, I'm sure he's being held. Is he being held? Uh, he's, mm. By then, since 1724, they really desperately need of France, because Russia is more powerful, Austria is more powerful. Things are much more relaxed than in the 1670s, when they thought they didn't need France so much. Right. But Van Moor never paints uh, the very deep reverence the ambassador had to make before the Sultan, as the ambassadors often don't really describe it in full for fear of being ticked off by their governments. Right. So it is, I think, the only such portrait painting of any of these receptions in which the ambassador is not being shown whatever ambassador they may be, whether it's a Swedish or English ambassador, yeah. they're invariably represented being constrained yeah. at hand. Yeah. And so it's, it's, I, I, I've no idea whether this is uh, a break in tradition or whether, as I say, it's been more... It, it, I think the, the held under their arms, yeah. but maybe not very closely, or maybe there are different degrees of... of uh, Restraint as they get nearer to the throne. Ed. Thank you. Um, the, the alliance between France and the Ottoman Empire being primarily one of strategic or real politic. It, it wasn't until the eight, late 18th, early 19th century that France had imperial designs on North, North Africa. What was the reason that the French did not see North Africa as an avenue for territorial expansion until that period, considering its geographical proximity and the depredations of um, Berber pirates and this sort of thing. Thank you very much for that question. <laughs> in fact, Louis XIV does have a disastrous attempt to get a port in 1666, which fails. And they go back, they return crestfallen, and it's much criticized. And th there had been earlier attempts in the 1570s, there were even plans to make a French prince king of Algiers or something like that. But I think the answer is it wasn't very rich. It didn't seem very interesting economically, whereas the Ottoman Empire was always considered to be very rich. Our India, they sometimes say. Um, and probably more glamorous with Jerusalem and the more remains of <coughs> classical antiquity. Yes. Um, you mentioned that the French had to cope, or Louis had to cope with uh, the Knights of Malta. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, given that the, the order was essentially run by French nobles, were they to some did they to some extent speak to the government in Paris or did they act completely independently? Again, it's a bit, a bit of both. They were, they were really used very cynically to 
attack Ottoman shipping to force Ottomans to use French merchant ships and pay. So it's actually quite advantageous to the French government that the Knights of Malta are behaving as pirates, in effect. Um, but there's this in incredibly complex mechanisms for exchanging slaves and saving each other, on which there have been a lot of very good books, but there's no view of the whole from all the different countries. And there are several Catholic orders and families specifically to buy back the slaves, Christian slaves in, in the Ottoman Empire. And, and later, when the Knights of Malta do go too far and seize the flagship of the Ottoman Navy with the chief black eunuch on it who's going to Egypt in about 1760, I think, then the French government does buy him back and give him back and the ship to the Ottoman government so as not to interfere with good relations. But it's, it's like a sort of side force for the French government to unleash when it suits it. So sometimes they do things that the French government doesn't like. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned both Carrick and Van Moore in Constantinople. I was just wondering about how were well, there other French artists there? Yes. And what do they do there? Are they primarily going there to what? Act as portrait painters for French and other Westerners residing, trading in Constantinople? Um, I was just interested in, in the career of a Western artist. Well, the, the answer is we, we don't know enough because they're so busy painting they don't leave enough of a written record or it hasn't been found. They go in the suite of the French ambassador, i.e. they're protected, their travel is paid for, oh, they, they have a safe, well, I don't think Van Moore did, but Carré did, a safe place in the embassy and they spend their time paint sketching often surreptitiously a sultan's possession, but then making it into ground oil paintings in the safety of the embassy. Oh, and there's non-stop Western artists in Constantinople from well, 1550. Well, I have yeah. there's, there's, there's also Favre, there's 26 albums have been found from the late 16th and early 17th century of embassies. There's a lot in Dresden and Vienna. Um, I've seen, I think, lots of Van Moore in Vienna, I think. It it is maybe it's not the end. But in in I don't know, I don't I think they're mainly in France or the Netherlands. He also worked for the British ambassador, but I don't know where his van words are. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, But he was or wasn't part of the French embassy, sorry, I didn't quite bad. Yes, he goes yeah, he yeah. goes out <coughs> Okay. in 1699, okay, I but I don't think he lives in the embassy. He's okay. there for 40 years. Okay. Um, but we know almost nothing about his conditions of life and work. But he was very popular with different ambassadors from different countries, as as Zonario was at the end of the Ottoman Empire. The, you, you had a captive market because every embassy wanted a record of their glamorous and successful mission. Was there an, arm, <coughs> an arms trade promoted by French, French cannon to Turkish currents? I don't think Turkish they textiles? need. I don't think they need. The French cannon, um, Turkish cannons were quite good, and guns. I don't think they needed them. But they, these anchors were supplied, and in, in theory, the, the Pope had banned all Catholic, all Christian powers from trading weapons with the Ottoman Empire. But of course, people. Avoided it. I think there were a lot of Venetian guns ended up on the Syrian coast. But I don't think, again, there's a full book on the arms trade. But it, shall we break the formal side now? Mm. You will sit at the seat of the custom and take both purchases and further questions. Yep. Thank you so much for such a delightful. Thank you.